recording for YouTube. All right, so there will be a quiz for the children. You must pay very close attention because we w- I will quiz you on, on this. So um, if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 59. It's kind of a, it's kind of a depressing scripture, but it, you know, it d- does describe the condition of our nation right now. Um, and, and so I want to encourage you to turn in that, that scripture if you have the courage to, to read it. Um, I'm going to start with this scripture verse. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 14. And, and so we, we live in a time when, as it says in Daniel 8, verse 12, when truth is flung to the ground. Truth is flung to the ground. I mean, finding what the truth is, I don't know if you've, if you've had the same problem I've had lately, is becoming harder and harder and harder. Truth is being flung to the ground. That's exactly what Daniel described of the Antichrist kind of spirit, uh, is that truth would be flung to the ground. And we certainly live in that time when the, finding what is really going on is getting harder and harder and harder. Isaiah 59, verse 14 says, I think, describes the condition of America so appropriately that justice is turned back and righteousness stands far away, for truth has stumbled in the street. Truth, finding truth. Uprightness cannot enter. Yes, truth is lacking. And listen to this, he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Isn't that describe what we're witnessing right now in America? If you turn aside from evil, you become the target of much criticism and opposition and even censorship. So that's the condition we live in in America. But God is not through yet. I want to encourage you, God is not through yet. And and so, you know, just, just what I'm going to do for what I'm going to do for the next, I don't know, six weeks or so, is I'm going to do, start a series called "Clarity in Confusing Times," where we try to get clarity about what really is going on. I mean, raise your hand if you feel like it's confusing to know what really is happening. I mean, it is confusing. I mean, you, it's like, OK, you can't go to the media to find out what's going on. They have a narrative they're pushing. If you go on, you know, Twitter or something, you might be led down into some crazy conspiracy theory. I mean, it's just crazy. It's it's so hard. There's so many opinions, so many things out there. It's so confusing. And I'm not saying I have all the answers by any means. By any means do I say that. But, uh, you know, I just feel like so much of God's church, the church of Jesus Christ in America, is like a sheep without a shepherd is we're wondering, just aimlessly going, okay, what is going on? Just the confusion is trying to make sense of what's happening and find the truth. And what is God saying right now? Um, not to mention the, the, I think, 40 prophets someone, someone recorded or someone counted. I don't know what you do for a living if you count how many people prophesied wrongly about Donald Trump. But someone counted 40 people that said, I guaranteed a, a Donald Trump victory. And, you know, so the church is in confusion right now. And, and so I want to hopefully bring clarity to, uh, to us. Now, again, I'm not saying I have all the answers. But, you know, what is God doing? What is God saying? What is happening in America? Um, just one side note, it is, I think, the only one I heard. No, I'm just kidding. One of the, one of the few voices that, that prophesied things exactly was young Stephen, who got up the, day, the Sunday before the election and said he had a dream of Joe Biden being elected. So maybe we should listen more to Steve. Maybe you should start a YouTube channel or Facebook Live and start sharing your prophecies and dreams, you know? But... Um, what I'm going to talk about over the next six weeks is, is if, this is what I'm talking about this Sunday, is God has given us, a Restoration Life, a mandate to intercede for America based upon God's original intention, and also that America would be a sheep nation that would resist the Antichrist government that is rising up in the earth. That is a mandate God has given us. I'm going to talk about that this Sunday. Uh, I think next Sunday I'm going to talk about the necessity of loving the truth and keeping ourselves from deception. 
Uh, and that would include, you know, keeping ourselves from the deception that's coming from the media, the narrative they're pushing, and keeping ourselves from being able to discern conspiracy theories from conspiracy facts. One thing that's happened is because the media can't be trusted now, it's opened a vacuum where conspiracy theories are being believed more and more. But some of them are theories. Some of them are actually true, and some of them are not. But how to, how to love the truth, to find out what the truth is, an incredibly confusing time we live in, navigating through the Internet censorship we're experiencing, um, and, and really hearing God's voice in the multitude of religious opinions that are out there. Oh, my goodness. The, the amount of religious opinions that are out there saying this and saying that. I mean, the, the body of Christ, if you haven't noticed, is incredibly divided right now. And more than any time ever, we need to be able to hear the voice of God. We need to be able to hear the voice of God. What is the Lord saying right now to his church? I'm going to also look into, you know, where we are today, there's been a decades-long war that's been, being, been waged in America that a lot of us don't even know about. Just to, how did we get to this point where we are as a nation? Um, I'm also going to talk about how to stand with the Lord for his destiny for this, for this nation while avoiding the dangers of Christian nationalism. If you haven't heard that phrase, it's becoming very out there. And, and a, lot of, a lot of leaders are calling for uh, warning of Christian nationalism. I'll, I'll get into that in a message without being overly focused on politics or turning our favorite politician into an idol and that kind of stuff, how are we also to make sense of the 40-plus prophetic voices who said Donald Trump would be president, okay? So how do we make sense of those things? Um, where things are going with the radical left in charge of the executive and legislative branch in this, in this country... And then finally, how is the church meant to respond in light of an increasingly uh, tyrannical government that wants to take away our freedoms in light of Romans 13? So I'm going to talk about, that's a lot of stuff to talk about. Some I'm going to talk about here, some I'm going to talk about just recorded. But anyway, there's a lot, a lot of stuff to talk about. But today I want to focus on praying for God's original intention for this nation and interceding for America's destiny. That really is a, a mandate that God has given to this church. Um, you know, we, we've been saying for years, there's about five different components of the vision that God has given to Restoration Life. We're, you know, we're meant to be a local church, a training center, a mission center, a ministry center, and a house of prayer. You know, and, and just, you know, we've talked a lot about those things over the years, but today I'm focusing on the, the one, one mandate as it relates to us being a house of prayer, and that is interceding for America and her destiny based upon God's original intention, and especially as we head to the end of the age, that America would be a sheep nation that remains a refuge uh, from uh, religious persecution, remains a remains a refuge that would resist the Antichrist government rising up in the earth and that would send the gospel out into the nation. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30. Ezekiel 22, verse 30. And this, this scripture verse should really challenge all of us when the Lord in Ezekiel's day, when judgment was coming upon the nation and it, uh, the nation of Israel had departed from God, and God was bringing judgment on that nation. Ezekiel was looking out, and the Lord was looking out. In verse 30, he said, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me so the land, for the land so that I would not destroy it, but I found no one. I believe in this hour we live in, in America, we live in historic, truly historic times in this nation. We have never lived in a moment like the time we live in right now. It is truly, you know, history will tell us whether that's true or not. I believe it's as historic as the time of the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. I believe that is as, as historic the time we live in in this nation. 
And God is raising up and calling for intercessors who, like Ezekiel 22, verse 30 said, they would stand in the gap and they would lay themselves out and they would intercede for this nation so God would not destroy it and so God would bring this nation back to his original intention, why he created America in the first place. That is a mandate God has given to this church, Restoration Life, is to intercede based upon God's original intention. Now, turn in your Bibles to Lamentations 1.9. You know it's getting depressing if you turn to the book of Lamentations. Lamentations 1.9 is a very, very powerful scripture for this nation. I believe this is a, a, the word of the Lord to America. I believe if ever there was a word of the Lord to America and the American church and to the inhabitants, the citizens of America, it would be a Lamentations 1.9. Is, is I'm going to read it actually out of the King James Version. I think that says it the way I want to say it. Lamentations 1.9. I'll skip the first verse. But talking about Israel, she did not consider her destiny. Therefore, her collapse was awesome. I want to read that again. She did not consider her destiny. The nation of Israel did not consider her destiny. Therefore, her collapse was awesome. If ever there is a word to America in the hour we live in, it's right now. We did not consider our destiny. Therefore, our collapse was awesome. I'm not saying America is going to collapse. But I'm saying is we must consider the destiny God has for America. We must consider the great destiny God has for America. And one of my, in case you, you don't know, there's been a lot of voices, especially in the evangelical church, been crying out against Christian nationalism, basically saying that we've got to be careful of blending in the cross of Jesus Christ with the American flag and uh, equating the kingdom of God with America and things like that. So there's been a, a, lot of, a lot of articles, a lot of evangelicals saying, you know, beware of Christian nationalism. I think some of that is needed correction because the church has become, you know, nationalistic in some sense. But I, I think at the same time, we have to be very, very careful that, and this is what happens in the American church, is the, or in really the church, is God will bring an area of correction and the pendulum will swing all the way to the other side. And I, I think, I, I, I'm very concerned that this cry against Christian nationalism is going to cause the, the Christians in America not to consider the destiny of this nation. And we've got to be very aware that we are not, we, we've got to be very aware that God has a destiny for America. And though, though perhaps some have gotten too political or some have gotten too, you know, focused on, you know, thinking that the kingdom of God in America are the same thing, we cannot lose sight of the great destiny for this nation. This nation is special. And I'm not saying we're more special than any other nation. I'm saying in the heart of God and the way he created this nation are awesome. And when we fail to remember the destiny God has for this nation, our collapse could be awesome. And so the church especially must consider the destiny of America from the heart of God. That's what I'm after. I'm after the heart of God. I'm after the heart of God. I wanna see the destiny of this nation through God's eyes and I want to feel the destiny of this nation from God's heart. I, it doesn't really matter to me about this historian's opinion or that person's opinion about what America is and should be. What was God's original intention in birthing this nation? That's what we're after. See, we are currently in the middle of a Marxist revolution in this nation. And it's been going on for, for many years. Uh, Karl Marx... A couple things he said we've got to be aware of is that he said that if you keep people from their history, they are easily controlled. If you keep people from their history, they are easily controlled. He also said if you can cut the people off from their history, 
then they can be easily persuaded. That has been going on in this nation for at least 20, 30, 40 years. I'm going to share with you the history of America. Uh, and a lot of us probably never, ever heard this in school growing up because there has been an attack upon the history of this nation. I believe it was Winston Churchill who said, whoever wins the victory in battle controls the, the history. In other words, who, they, whoever wins a victory in war controls the narrative that is pushed out in history, the historical narrative. And so what has been going on in America is the Christian roots of this nation have been removed from the history books in school. And so a lot of us really have no idea of the Christian beginnings of this nation. And if we lose sight of that destiny and God's original intention, our collapse can be awesome. And so I'm going to spend some time today just going through the history of this nation. I want to encourage the young kids to pay attention like Evan in the back. Yep, yep. And everyone else. Even if y'all two need to separate, if you can't focus, that's, you know, we, this is important for all the kids to learn history, okay, from true history, not from a, a, a way to remove the Christian influence in this nation. Because, we, you know, when I'm talking about God's original intention, I'm about to tell you, I'm about to share with you God's original intention and what happened in history. This is what God is after in this nation, this is not what a lot of politicians and church leaders, but what God is after in this nation. So really, it, the history and the birth of America did not begin with the pilgrims. It began with the Reformation. It began in, what, 1517 when Martin Luther, the kids will love this one, Martin Luther, sitting on the toilet, got a revelation of justification by faith. He was in the throne room, and God revealed to him justification by faith, that the just, or that there, you can be justified by faith. Just, you know, be listening to God when you're in the throne room, because God can speak. He launched the Reformation from Martin Luther's toilet, and it turned the church upside down, and it broke the Protestant, it broke, the, it split the Catholic church in two, and the Protestant and the Catholics and that launched the Reformation. And through Martin Luther's teachings and his writings, it returned the church back to the scriptures. And through the Gutenberg printing press, it spread the scriptures and Martin Luther's teaching all throughout Europe. And it brought an incredible Reformation. And many historians trace the birth of America to the Reformation. Without the Reformation, America would have never become what it is as a nation. So the birth of America is traced to the Reformation. So several decades later, as the Reformation spread from Germany into England, there was a group of, of Christians known as separatists. We know them as pilgrims. But there was the separatists who, who uh, what happened in England was the, um, the Church of England broke away from the Catholic Church and became the Anglican Church. And the, it was basically the same thing as the Catholic Church, but the separatists realized, okay, the Reformation had touched them and hit them, and they were like, we can no longer be under this Church of England. It's too corrupt. We've got to separate from, from this church. And because of their separation, they began to experience religious persecution. Religious persecution. They were persecuted, and so they fled from England into Holland for about 12 years, and there, the living conditions became so hard that they said, okay, they, they felt like God was leading them to America. So they come to America, and, and so the, the pilgrims and all they went through, the suffering and all they went through, you can look at the birth of this nation as the pilgrims were that initial seed that God was planting in the wilderness of America. See, God was on the move to give birth to a nation that would be unique, of, of, uh, set apart from many other nations. But it was, it was religious persecution that led the pilgrims, the separatists, to this nation. And, you, you know, you can read all about how God preserved them and, and stuff like that, you know, how God watched over them. But they, I mean, these... 
these leaders suffered immensely religious persecution, the, the conditions even getting here to this nation, uh, the conditions when they got to America. I mean, you, you arrive here and there's no hotel, there's, just, there's no food. I mean, you got to go out and catch your food. I mean, so, I mean, the, the suffering they, they went through, but God was forming in the pilgrims a seed that he could plant in the ground in America that would then multi be multiplied through the Puritan movement and then the First Great Awakening, then the Revolutionary War and the Constitution. God was on the move to give birth to a nation. About a decade later, John Winthrop led the Puritans to establish the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And the main difference between, he was the leader of the Puritans, the main difference between the Puritans and the Pilgrims or the Separatists was the Puritans wanted to reform the Church of England from the inside, whereas the Separatists felt like there was no hope, so they wanted, they broke away saying that's the only hope. And so the Puritans wanted to reform the Church of England from the inside. The Puritans were, uh, were staunchly Calvinist because they were influenced by the Reformation. They were Calvinists. They believed uh, in the Calvinistic view of the sovereignty of God. But they felt led by the providence of God to come to America. And let, let, I want to read just real quick what Winthrop was saying and I shared this in a message a few weeks ago, but just want to read it again. As he's journaling in his thoughts why he wants to come to America, he writes down this, that, you know, trying to say, okay, should I go or should I not go? It will be of service to the church of great consequence to carry the gospel into those parts of the world and to raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist. That's pretty interesting to raise a bulwark against the kingdom of Antichrist, which the Jesuits, where they were part of the Catholic Church, and they wanted to, uh, they opposed the Reformation, which the Jesuits labored to rear up in those parts. In other words, he's writing down, and he becomes the governor, one of the, the first governors, he's writing down why he should go, and he feels like God's saying that he's to go to resist the Antichrist. Isn't that interesting? He says, and, and the second thing he writes down is, all other churches of Europe are brought to desolation because of persecution. So persecution has broken out in Europe by the Catholic Church upon the church that has broken free from the Reformation. And he says, who knows but that God has provided this place to be a refuge for many whom he means to save out of the general calamity uh, seeing that the church has no place left to fly but into, into the wilderness, what better work can there be than to go and provide tabernac tabernacles and food for her against whatever comes against her? In other words, in the very beginning, there are three purposes we see in Winthrop that he writes down. I believe he captures, I believe he captures the heart of God and the destiny of this nation greater than any other that I've seen is that America was meant based on God's original intention to resist the Antichrist, to be a place of refuge from religious persecution, and to be a place that would send the gospel out into the nations. Now, historians and pundits and politicians and you know, religious leaders and everyone else debates about what really is the purpose of America and you know, why, why did God create America. I believe that God's destiny for this nation is those three things. Resist the Antichrist, send the gospel to the nations, and be a refuge from religious persecution. And so after, and, and so the Puritan movement began to spread throughout New England and things like that. And, you know, the, just, just some, you know, people think the Puritans were these staunch religious people. I mean, the Puritans are so mischaracterized. They were incredible, devout lovers of God. And God, you know, you, to what, the way I look at it this is the pilgrims were the seed God planted and the Puritan movement in New England was the seed multiplied. God was on the move to give birth to a, a nation as one nation under God. Now, the Puritan movement in New England grew, but over time, as with any other movement, that Puritan movement began to wane. The fire began to go out. 
the, you know, the lukewarmness set in. And what God did, and, and a lot of it is even attributed to the age of reason or the enlightenment. The enlightenment, Anna's learning about the enlightenment in school. Is, you know, it's almost identical to what is happening in, in, in our country where the enlightenment, the age of reason and science and thinking logically and stuff like that began to take over religion so that churches began to decrease and the, and the pursuit of money began to increase. And so that Puritan movement began to, be, began to die out and church attendance began to die out. Sounds a lot like where we're at, doesn't it? And it was into this very culture where God breathed his spirit into what is now called the first great awakening. Into the dry bones of America, God breathed the Holy Spirit into these dry bones to send a great revival in, in American history. Led by preachers, it was primary, the, the, two of the main leaders were Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. Jonathan Edwards, and the two leaders could not be any more different. I mean, Jonathan Edwards, if you've ever read Jonathan Edwards' material, I mean, one sentence is as long as a paragraph or a page. I mean, it's like this, I mean, just so intelligent and, you know, he's so uh, intellectual. And, you know, they would say when Jonathan Edwards would speak, it was very monotone and dry and, you know, just, you know, just, just, it was not that entertaining to listen to, but in, 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 uh, in his church in New England, God began to pour out his spirit through his preaching and through his teaching. And even some would say in, in Jonathan Edwards, the famous, uh, the famous uh, message he wrote, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, they came under such conviction that they would grip the pews in front of them. They, they would white knuckle and, and the fear of God would come on them to such a degree that they would say, what must we do to be saved? And George Whitfield was almost the entire opposite. He was charismatic. He was very emotional. He had this voice that boomed where you, George Whitfield would speak and he could speak to 30,000 people at a time without microphones or speakers. He had this booming voice and George Whitfield was from England, and he was, you know, he gets, he gets saved, he gets born again, and it transforms his life. He's praying about what to do. He's, he's leading a revival in England, but the Lord lays it on his heart, go to the 13 colonies and bring about one nation under God. It's so awesome. So he comes, and, and so many, many leaders think that the, the Great Awakening was... It was the height of it was from the, 19, the 1730s to the 1740s, but I think it even carried on to, throughout George Whitfield's preaching. But Whitfield was just this man that, that traveled up and down the 13 colonies and, and was just calling out to everyone, you must be born again. You must experience the new birth. Um, he was so given to his preaching that he preached, I think, 18,000 sermons in his lifetime. 18,000 sermons. Even the thing that touched me most is at the very end of his life, Whitfield, his health is failing, but he says, I still must go preach the gospel. And he preached his final message, and then the next day he passed away. That's devotion to preaching the gospel. And so a lot of historians believe that that from through you know through the first great awakening, especially under George Whitfield, from 1740 to 1770, that a lot of historians say the first great awakening was the national conversion of America. That is awesome. I'm not again. That doesn't mean everyone was saved, but so many in this nation, the vision, and that's what I want you to see. I want you to see the hand of God and the founding of this nation. The vision George Whitfield had. Uh, 13 colonies as one nation under God. When he, lay, when he breathes his last breath, his vision to unite 13 nations as, or 13 colonies as one nation under God was fulfilled. So the, the pilgrims were the seed God planted, the Puritans were the seed multiplied, and the Great Awakening was that seed watered to bring, for, to bring forth one nation under God. See, this is, there's never been... I mean, perhaps Israel, but there's never been a nation. Uh, I, I guess Israel would apply, yes, for sure. But there's, there's you know, to see one, that, uh, at America at its very, very beginnings was one nation under God. God has put his, uh, his eye on the founding of this nation based on his original intention. 
So now, and I've shared this so many times, but I was reading in the light and the glory, and, and, and one governor that was loyal to the crown said, if you ask an American who is his master, he will tell you he has none nor any governor but Jesus Christ. That was the condition of this nation when God brought it forth. We have no governor but Jesus Christ. They were one nation under God. And so this gave rise, gave rise, or gave rise to the cry up and down America of we have no king but Jesus. The first great awakening converted a nation and made the 13, na the 13 colonies one nation under God. Now here, here's something you, you probably don't realize that the, the first great awakening led to the Revolutionary War. And I, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of people talk, we need another revival, we need another, another revival. That revival led to the Revolutionary War. Without that revival, there would have been no Revolutionary War. We would, we would have English accents. So, Anna, I would actually have an English, English accent. I cannot do an English accent at all, but Anna's pretty good. I try to do it and I sound terrible. But I would actually have an English accent if we did not have the First Great Awakening. But here's the thing. It was America's preachers who led the way to the Revolutionary War. And don't think I'm like calling for a Revolutionary War. I'm not. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I'm just telling you history is Galatians 5.1 was a huge verse of Scripture. The preachers up and down the 13 colonies would say, quote, Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and not be uh, subject again to a yoke of slavery. And they would preach that, uh, that obedience or, or resisting tyranny is obedience to God. It was the preachers that led the charge towards the Revolutionary War. The logic was this. It's like, listen, God has brought forth a great awakening. God has brought forth 13 colonies as one nation under God. We cannot just allow... To, you know, all that had to happen, and now to go back under the yoke of slavery and tyranny and uh, all these regulations, we cannot come under that yoke. But it was the preachers that led the way to the Revolutionary War. Have you ever heard of the Black Robed Regiment? The Black Robed Regiment? This was actually what the British called the American preachers because they wore the black robes because they came out of the Anglican church. They wore the black robes, and they were called the Black Robe Regiment. But they, the English, this is what the English said about the Black Robe Regiment, the preachers in America, is that the British blamed the preachers in America for American independence. So that's quite different than... What's going on in American churches today where the gospel has been so watered down by seeker-sensitive preachers? John Adams said that the pulpits have thundered. Talking about America's preachers, the pulpits have thundered. America's preachers are the most conspicuous, most ardent, and influ influential in the awakening and revival of American principles and feelings that led to the American independence. See, it was America's preachers preaching about the need. And, and this, is, this went on like a couple decades before the Revolutionary War. The Great Awakening awakened America's preachers and they began to preach about freedom and they began to preach about liberty and they began to preach about equality and all these things about about 20 or 30 years before the revolution. It was America's preachers that, that led the charge in their congregations to say, we cannot come under the yoke of Great Britain. We must resist the, the heavy yoke of King George III. We must get rid of that because God has called us to be people of equality and liberty and freedom and justice. That was through the, through the preachers in America. And I, in my notes, I've got a lot more. I got a lot more details in there, but it, it was it was the preachers that led that charge. I mean, how different is that today than what we are experiencing in our nation? 
As I, as I went back and I studied history, it made me realize, okay, the reason God was able to give birth to this nation was through the devotion of those, uh, of Christians. It was Christians who became the salt and the light. It was Christians that, that functioned as salt and light. And, you know, Jesus said that, that if the salt loses its saltiness, it is no good except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Isn't that what's, that, that is what is happening today in, the, in America. I believe the condition of America today can be directly tied to the church in America. Christians in America have lost their saltiness. Christians in America have been so, uh, we become so influenced by the world, we've lost our saltiness, we've lost our influence, we're no longer functioning as salt and as light. And I believe you can even look at and say, well, a lot of the reason is, a lot of the blame is due to the pulpits. The preachers have failed to preach the truth of the gospel. They brought in a watered-down gospel, a seeker-sensitive gospel. For the last 30, 40 years, where the seeker-sensitive movement has increased, you look at the condition of this nation. See, if we're going to get this nation back, it's not going to come through a politician it's not going to come through Donald Trump. It's not going to come through a political party. This, there's, there is not a political solution to the problem of America. America was founded as it was founded because the people in America, the believers in America were salt and light, and they influenced the government of this nation to where they were truly one nation under God. And if we're going to get back to where we need to be, it begins with the church. It does not begin with politicians or leaders or a political party. In fact, America cannot function as God intended and as the founding fathers intended if we are not a Christian people. And, and that's what we're witnessing right now. We've fallen away from God and therefore, what we're seeing is but just a, a dim shadow of what God intended for this nation. See, we can, uh, you know, to be that, you know, to be what our founding fathers intended, one nation under God, of the people, by the people, for the people, we the people are the governing force in this nation. That is the way they intended it. And it's meant to be through the church, and I want to say this, this way, the church is meant to be the salt and the light that influences government, that influences culture. And so that begins in the church, that begins in the pulpits, that begins with God's leaders preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ, not watering it down. So because the culture has changed, we're trying to we're trying to make our churches bigger. I mean, the, the, probably there's, if you put, if you look at history, there's probably been a, never a time in history where more people have gone to church than there is right now. Look at all the mega churches and the churches around this nation. There is probably more people in church today than ever at any other time in history. And yet look at the condition of our nation. It be, if, if revival is going to break out, it begins with prayer and it begins in the pulpits. It begins with God's leaders fearlessly preaching the word of God with boldness and with courage, not, not watering it down because people don't like to hear what we're saying. See, we need another great awakening. And I believe God is going to give us a, a third great awakening. That is the hope for this nation. Jesus Christ is the hope for this nation. Jesus Christ is the hope for America. God breathed upon the writing of the Constitution. I mean, you, you can just look at it. It's the most brilliant document, one of the most brilliant documents that has ever been penned. And there's no doubt the Spirit of God was brooding over our leaders who most of, the, most of them at that time were either Christians or heavily influenced by Christianity. See, we need a third great awakening. And I believe God is, I believe God has given, he's, been, he's given the first great awakening. 
He's given the second great awakening. And I do believe that we are going to have a third great awakening. Now, that is not intended just to make America great. I, I don't believe God's heart is to make America great again. God's heart is to fulfill his eternal purpose. God's heart is to bring forth a pure and spotless bride. God's heart is to have what he's always wanted, which is a people that are possessed by his spirit, that are his, that are, that are fully his. But the, the, uh, the overflow of a great awakening is a nation that comes back to God, that turns back to its godly Christian principles. And so I guess to, to bring this message to a close, the, what God is calling us to, and one of our mandates in this church is to cry out to God for the destiny of America. You know, sometimes we will have to play, pray into political issues, but it's not meant to be political. It's not meant to be Republican versus Democrat. I'm convinced both parties are two heads of one snake. They're both corrupt to the core. You know, this is not political. It is not Republican versus Democrat. It's not about that at all. It is about God's heart for this nation, interceding for God's heart for this nation. It is not about a political candidate. It is not about one leader. It is not about idolizing any man or thinking this man, only this man can save America. No, God will save America. Only the Lord can save this nation. And so God is calling us to a, you know, and I just want to say what an incredible honor it has been to labor in prayer for the way we labored in prayer for these elections and for all that was done. What an incredible thing to see the response of everyone's intercession. I mean, sacrificing time and energy and things like that to lay themselves out to pray for this nation. And I believe that's only the beginning. We, are, we have so many things to pray for in this nation. Is, is we must pray for this nation to become that sheep nation. I talked about that in a few sermons ago, in, I think at the end of last year or whatever. But God wants America to be a sheep nation that resists the Antichrist in his government which, by the way, is rising up in the earth. God does not want that here in America. God does not want the Antichrist government that is rising up in Europe to be in this nation. And as it has intercessors, we must wage war against that, that enemy rising up in this nation. We say, not on our watch will we allow this evil Antichrist government to come into this nation. Not on our watch. We're interceding for um, God's original intention, God's original purpose, God's destiny for this nation. We're, we're praying, we're crying out that God's intention would be fulfilled. We're clinging to our destiny. We're holding fast to the destiny that if we fail to remember our destiny, our collapse will be great. May we remember the birth of this nation. May we, may we cherish that in our heart to say, God, what an incredible move of the spirit you brought forth when you birthed this nation. May we never take that for granted. May we continue to cry out in intercession to say, God, would you bring this nation back to your original intention, and would you allow America to continue and to, to resist the uh, Antichrist government rising up? May we become, at the end of the age, what you have ordained and destined us to be. Don't forget the destiny of this nation. Don't lose sight of the destiny of this nation. <laughs> now, again, this is not political that we do play, pray into political issues at times. This is about fighting for God's destiny for this nation. We need, a, we need a third great awakening. I mean, what would happen, what would happen if the church 
prayed for a third great awakening and prayed for the preachers in pulpits to repent and prayed for the church to repent. What if we prayed for that the way we prayed for the election? Okay, so now I'm getting myself in trouble here. That means we have to pray a lot more. But for real, what if we focused our energy? And I mean, really, when you study history, the solution is not fixing it politically. The only reason we have the current government we have is because we were one nation under God when God began to move. I think we need to get back to the roots, back to the foundations, and pray as intercessors. If we want to see America turn back to be what God has intended, if we want to see that, I think it begins with a, th with a third great awakening, contending for a third great awakening, contending for America's preachers to repent and to stop preaching a watered-down gospel and to stop idolizing church growth and to stop worrying about how many people come or how many people come here and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness and with courage and with clarity. See, that's what we need right now. And we need intercessors standing in the gap to say, God, would you send a third great awakening to this nation? We are broken. We need you. And I just want to encourage us. It doesn't, you know, in terms of a constitutional republic, it doesn't look great right now. But I want to encourage you, God is not finished with this nation. God is not finished with America. And I just remember even the way he gave me that word, Lazarus. Lazarus, when it looked like when Lazarus was dead. When it, when it looked like America was dead. When it looked like the Constitutional Republic was dead. God called forth Lazarus out of the grave. And he said, come forth. God's not finished with America yet. I want you to know that. Yes, we're being judged right now. America is under God's judgment right now. We have to know that. I think we already do. We are under God's judgment, but God is with the remnant in this nation. God is with us. And I just want us to have great confidence. It, even though no matter what we see right now, this is a redemptive judgment. It is not a destructive judgment. It is a redemptive judgment that America, so that America could become what God originally intended, especially as we head towards the end of the age. So I, wanted, I just want to encourage you as an intercessor for America. We want to just, even though, you know, even though it, things have not turned out the way we hoped for this nation, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. God is not finished yet. God is not finished yet. And God is calling us even more to stand in the gap, to turn this nation to once again be one nation under God.